All right. Here we are. All right, so. All right, it seems like I got kicked out. He says cheering. I, I, all right. Oh, it seems like the Wi-Fi doesn't like me today. That's too bad. Um, all right, well, at least I know if I get kicked out because the chat disappears and everyone's video cameras also disappear. So um, what I want to know from you guys is did my audio like cut out in the seconds leading up to my disconnection? Because I need, that's going to be a big deal. Or were you able to understand me until I went away? All right. I guess if I'm in the middle of talking about something important, I guess I'll just ask you guys what you last were able to understand for me. So that's okay. I can only assume that it's going to happen at least once. So today has not been a good day in terms of my uh, Zoom connection. So it's unfortunate, but I guess we'll just have to live with it. Since the lesson is broken up into two weeks, anyways, it's not like it's going to be super long. It's just going to be something that today, it's just an extra daily challenge. All right. Let's see if this works. All right. So, some information generally about the mill. So we use the mill for is we take a part, usually some aluminum rectangular stock tubing which I have right here. Looks like this, the rectangular prism. If you look at its face, you see it has uniformly thick walls. And that's what we make maybe 90% of our robot parts out of. What the mill does is that you can cut into these aluminum uh, tubing parts. You can drill into them. You can face off their surfaces. And you can do this with very high precision with the mill. The whole, the name of the game for the mill is that if you want something to be of a very high tolerance and off by no more than one thou, so basically you want a super accurate part, you're going to use the mill, especially with these parts. So the mill has um, these controllers on each of the three axes, and when you spin them, you can shift the table on which the vice is seated, which holds this. So for example, for the x-axis, you turn the spindle and it goes this way or this way. The y-axis, it does have that same mechanism. And for the, z um, no, the z-axis goes to and fro. And then the y-axis, up and down, um, that is controlled the same way you would control a drill set. So, we use the mill, again, to create parts out of this aluminum tubing. We also have um, uh, a certain amount of blocks, so better like solid aluminum, that we um, mill stuff out of, particularly bearing blocks. I'm sure that um, if any of you have attended a design meeting, um, Ben has probably shared something about that. Um, we also use the mill to prepare length of aluminum stock for the CNC. So the CNC um, is something that I think me and Kyle are going to collaborate on in terms of making a lesson for that. So I guess I'll just have to say stay tuned for that. But what we do for that is we just make sure that each part is of a certain length so that if there's like, we need to create like a, a weird shape in the, in the aluminum tubing, we can just go to the CNC and put it on there and does a better job. And a second, I just had to admit Kenny. All right. So, and um, oftentimes you are connecting um, one piece of this aluminum tubing with another. And if you cut it off with a bandsaw or something else, you can see that it has like a rough edge onto it. So it won't be like perfectly perpendicular. As you can see, it has like this tiny little tab on it that sticks out a little bit more than the other side. 
So it's not going to be perfectly perpendicular when you place it against a flat surface. Well, what if you do want it to be perfectly perpendicular? What you do is you machine off this edge to create a very flat and smooth surface so that it can be perfectly perpendicular to a flat surface. Because that is very important for creating uh, rectangular frames and just a whole lot of general mechanisms when you're fabricating a robot. All right, so there is a lot to learn about the mill. In fact, I think this is going to be a, a bit of an information dump. So I want to make sure that you guys are clear on a lot of the um, on a lot of what I'm referencing to, basically. So I I think I'm just gonna go through each one of these, and I'll just take a couple seconds and get the thing that I'm referencing. So first off, we got an end mill. I'll show you what that is. This right here is an end mill. It looks kind of similar to a drill bit, and all right, looks like I was booted again. Okay, so where did I leave off? What was the last thing you guys heard coming from my mouth? Terminology. So, all right, the end mill. All right. Okay, so obviously, all the way from my garage, it looks like the internet speed isn't quite fast enough for me to be able to screen share today, which is fine. What I'll do is just, I'll read off the slides, but I'll just explain what's on them, which I think is going to be fine. Most of it is probably better to just learn from this. Anyways, so that's all right. I mainly just use a slice of notes anyways. All right, so first off, what you need to know before you start learning about the mill, this is the main tool called an end mill. Looks very similar to a drill bit, but you notice that its profile, it's a perfect rectangle. So a drill bit has like a cone shaped tip that's to drill into the wood, or not the wood, the metal, and you know create a circle of a void, a hole, where no hole used to be. But this does not do that though. What this does is it uses these blades, we call them flutes. This end mill has four flutes because you see it has four channels across its profile. And what these flutes do is, as it spins, it's going to be spinning in this orientation, it's going to be cutting away with its blade from the metal. And what that does is that it leaves a nice finish, and um, it's very it's very thick, it's chunky. It can take a lot of pressure or load or force from a lateral direction, which a little bit cannot do. What this does is, is that it allows you to take um, take material off of a block or a piece of tubing from almost any angle or any axis. Yes, it is chunky. It's a yeah, these are like chonker drill bits, as you would say. So, um, so uh, something uh, that you want to know about this is that um, these have four flutes, and other um, other end mills have two flutes. There are some end mills; um, they actually call them router bits for CNC. They only have one. And there are some end mills that are usually meant for cutting steel, which have six or eight or 12 loops, which means that they have like a bunch of tiny little channels that you use to work away the steel. And the number of loops, all right, who did it again? That's not funny, okay. Um, let's see. Would it be better if, I'm not sure whether or not I should use my phone for right now. I don't know, I'll just, if this happens again, I'm just gonna use my phone because I don't think my phone disconnected at all. I don't know why the Wi-Fi is better on my phone, but I might just have to deal with it. Anyways, so I left off at um, the count of flutes on the end note, right? Are you guys able to listen to that? Of like higher for steel. Turn off my camera. 
but I want you guys to see each part of this. Maybe over here. Be better. Okay. So, anyways, um, for our mill, we either use four flutes most of the time, or we just use. I turned off my phone camera like a minute ago. Oh, looks like it caught up on my laptop screen. Whatever. <laughs> oh my god, my internet's awful today. Anyways, four flutes we use most of the time because aluminum is like. It's not like a super super soft metal, but again, it's not that it's not that strong either, like steel. So using uh, four flutes is usually the optimum amount of flutes. You won't see like six or eight flutes that we use because that's more for steel. We're not cutting steel, and the reason why our CNC router has router bits that only have one flute is because those bits spin around so fast that getting the chips out of the way would be extremely difficult if it did have more than one flute for the chips to escape. So if you have a lot of flutes, it's harder for the chips to escape and you need something to push them out, like some sort of like coolant system that sprays liquid onto the parts. Or you run the risk of the end mill getting clogged up, which can cause other problems. But if provided you use a end mill, four flutes on aluminum, you should be good to go. All right, the next part, X, Y, and Z axis. I explained this briefly um, a few minutes ago. And um, what you need to know, it's just like a coordinate plane for mass. X is left and right, the Y is up and down. And the Z axis is all of these axes are relative to you looking down onto the tool bed. So the Y would be up and down and the Z would be forward and backward. So the Z would be like moving the tool closer to or further away from the part. So, all right, the DRO. The DRO is a tool that is connected to the mill and stands for a digital read output. What this does is it measures how far away um, you have turned a specific axis. We only have a DRO for the X and the Y, but um, what you need to know about it is that it can measure how many thousandths of an inch you have traveled from point A to point B on a certain axis. So for example, if I rotate it, rotate it, rotate it, the DRO can tell me um, how much further I need to go before I've traveled exactly one inch from point A to point B. So, yeah. And it's extremely useful because this is the main way in which you can get a very, um, very accurate part that measures the nearest power. And, all right. So next, we have the edge finder tool. Let me just get that real quick. All right. Here we have the edge finder. So basically a little metal rod, but as you can see, you can offset the tip right here. I can even move it around. It's quite easy to do so. What this does is you move the edge. Oh, first you stick it. You stick this in like a drill chuck, the same way you would for putting a drill in a drill press. Except you put the drill chuck on the mill. And once this is in the drill chuck, it spins around. And so that's offset like this. You're going to see the difference between the center of this cylinder and this cylinder. This is going to spin really fast depending on how far it is from the actual center of the center tube on which the drill chuck is clamping onto. And as you move it closer to the edge of a part, for example, it's going to move the edge finder closer and closer to being accurate. So you went, I, too, I went too far that time, but you can get the picture. As soon as it gets pretty much perfect, what you do is you get the DRO and then you zero it. The same way you would zero like um, 
you would zero a scale in chemistry to find out like how much mass is added to something after you put something on the scale, something like that. It's the same concept. So after you have that zero, what you do is, okay, so now you have, let's say this is the x-axis, right? And I'm x-axis. So now I have a zero, except there still is the radius of this that we have to account for. Now, thankfully, the manufacturers made this radius, um, this small radius up here, exactly 0 0.1 inches. So what you do is after you find this edge, you go past that by 0 0.1 inches, and then you zero that. And that is how you get the perfect edge of a part for one axis. And now you repeat that process for the other axis, and then you get the zero for that. And so then, once you put both axes to zero, zero, you will have the corner of this part. Now let's say you want to have um, a part that has a hole that is like 0 0.463 inches away from this edge and 0 0.392 inches away from this edge. Well, with the DRO, it's going to be extremely easy to just fine tune each axis controller until you get to that exact spot and then get the drill bit at whatever size it needs to be, drill down, and then you have the hole. Extremely accurate, and it'll work perfectly with whatever you need. And so that is the purpose for this edge finder. Um, we, do not, we don't use this edge. Um, I'm sure this has a use, but we don't really use it that much. And next, what I'm going to talk about is um, Actually, let me get the end, the end mill again, because I need to show you guys this. This is pretty important. All right. So a lot of the time that most people spend uh, using the mill is going to be time spent um, getting a piece down to a certain length or cutting across here to make it shorter. And so what I want you guys to see is that, I'm not sure how accurate this is, but you can see that it's designed to cut a certain direction. You can see that if I push my finger against here, I can feel a point. And if I push my finger against here on the other side, it's not that sharp, it's not going to cut me at all. Or on this side, I can definitely feel that that's going to do some damage if I try to rake my hand across it. So, intuitively, it could be inferred that making, so, for example, I would have to rotate the end mill like this. And of course, the mill has only that option. It can't be reversed. So, when it's spinning like this, the teeth are going towards me. That means that if the blades are in contact with this part and the blades are going towards me, that means that if I use the y-axis and push the part away from me, the part in these blades will be moving in opposite directions. And the, the more slowly you go, the less of an effect that this has, except for one thing. It's like um, there's going to be more force and more cutting power behind the end mill um, the faster you go in the opposite direction, which means that if you want to take off a considerable amount of material on the part, it's best to go against, or as we call it, um, that would be a climbing cut. But on the other hand, let's say that you want like just a little bit to be taken off. Like this is the final pass. You're almost just a little bit over the final dimension that you want this to be in terms of the length what you would do is that you would take that final pass, push the part towards you, along with the end mill blade going towards you. This is called a falling cut. And what this does is, with the blades going in the same direction that I'm moving the part, it makes it so that the end finish of the tubing is going to be a lot better. So for the, um, the climbing cut, the finish is going to be pretty rough especially since our end mills aren't very sharp and we should probably get new ones. But besides the point, 
if we do a falling cut, the end result, the end finish is going to be pretty nice. So that's what we strive for, especially when we want something that can be perpendicular and completely flat in terms of its side profile. So I'm not sure how obvious it is to you guys, but you can see that this side is pretty shiny. It's almost a mirror. And this side is a little bit more rough, especially the bandsaw cuts and everything. We would prefer this side to this side in pretty much every situation uh, in terms of fabricating a robot. So carbon cuts and falling cuts are something that you have to keep in mind. It becomes super intuitive after some practice with the tools. But um, yeah, that's all I wanted to say about um, that sort of process. So that was a lot of information. And now we get back to basics. I'm going to talk about specific safety for the mill. All right, so you guys know what the first rule is. I don't even need the slides for this. All right, can someone put in the chat what the main priority is? Yeah, safety glasses. Safety glasses, obviously a must. What, number one priority? Yes, I like that, the, the B in the parentheses. That sums up my feelings perfectly about safety glasses. All right. So in addition to wearing safety glasses, um, what you must do is keep in mind that the mill, um, the moving part for the mill is very similar to the drill press. It has a part which rotates around, which uh, spins the end mill. But this is, um, this is a very high torque spinning mechanism, much more so than the drill press. And with end mills, it's easy to get clothing or hair or like a loose part caught in the end mill. And it's very hard to stop the mill. Um, the mill isn't going to be torqued out very easily. So loose clothing can get caught. So make sure to roll up long sleeves on a hoodie, tie hair back, all the usual stuff that I've said a couple times before. And you should be good to go in terms of that regard. So the mill, um, it, on average, it takes more time to complete a part on the mill than any other part. Solely for the characteristics of parts made on the mill is like, you need to be very accurate with parts on the mill, which means that it takes a lot of time. It can take, you know, 15, 30 minutes of cutting, on some of the big parts that I've had to do uh, in prior years, you know, maybe like upwards of an hour. So that means that there's like an hour of almost nonstop cutting or, you know, shaving or stuff like that. That builds up a lot of heat on the part. So that means that you want coolant, especially for making a cut that you stop and if that you don't stop for like a couple of minutes. You're going to want to put coolant on the end mill where it, at the location where it is cutting into the mill. So both cool off the metal and cool off the end mill. Um, maybe just like, you know, take a spray bottle of coolant and just spray it a couple of times every minute or so and you should be good to go. All right, so oftentimes um, you need to keep in mind the location of the end mill in relation to the tool bed. What I mean by this is that um, oftentimes, um, you can run the risk of making it so that the end mill starts to cut through the vise or cut down far below where the tool ends. And I just want everyone to make sure that they know the position of the end mill and that they don't cut into the mill itself. And we can avoid a costly mistake. All right. So our end mill, or our mill, it's uh, pretty small. In fact, I'm pretty sure it's called a mini mill where we bought it. Um, and we just want to make sure that um, uh, you're just not like cranking the axis rotators too fast um, because it has a chance of shaking, especially um, in the scenario where we get back and our lab space has like banquet tables or something. Um, it'll be very easy to shake the table around or shake the mill around to try and get the 
tool bed from one axis, from one side of the axis to the other. And yeah, that is, that was a lot of information, but that is, you know, the mill just requires a large introduction, I guess. All right, so next, what I'm going to do is I'm going to do, um, the basics of the mill, and then next week we'll get a little bit more into the more complex stuff like the DRO. But for this week right now, what I'm going to teach you guys is um, how to use each part of the end mill, or each part of the mill, excuse me, because that in itself is also a lot of information. And I'm also going to show you guys how to get a nice finish and you know cut down the length of a piece of tubing. So yeah, um, I'm going to stop this video, which should definitely help the bandwidth of my Wi-Fi. I'm going to start my phone video. Which hmm. all right. And any second now. This is frustrating. Okay. Um I'm going to really quickly end the meeting on my phone and I'm going to join again. So I just take a minute or two. All right. All right. We have my phone have camera. My phone. But it looks like it looks like a van joking. What is up with that? Okay. What is up with that? Okay. Mute this. Cancel the audio on my phone because we don't need that right now. And I want to point this at the mill. All right. All right. So Okay, it seems like from my laptop screen, okay, so what do you guys see from my phone camera? Do you guys just see the back of my head or do you see the mill? All right, that looks, so it seems like the issue is coming from my computer's bandwidth, which honestly, I don't have too big of a problem with anymore. If you guys, can see this. Hello. If you guys can see the mill right here, that's all that matters. So, all right, let's get going. In fact, I'm going to free my phone from its cage. So, all right, so here's what the mill looks like. Um, Forgive me if I have to turn the camera to my face for a couple of seconds. Just want to make sure that I can see the chat. All right. Hello. All right. So here it is. Um, so a recap of what I was talking about. It's um, I realized that it's probably it was probably difficult for you guys to uh, visualize a lot of what I was trying to explain. So here's just a rundown of all the features that our mill has. The on off button, so I turn it on, boom. We have the power indicator and the RPM. We usually don't mess with the RPM too much. We usually keep it at like maybe half of its maximum RPM, and that usually does the job in most cases. Here, this is the axis controller. It moves the end mill up and down. And there's this lever right here that we use to lock it. That doesn't move around when we are cutting apart. Here is the x-axis controller. Um, I apologize for the shaking, but um, my setup for the second table right here is just two saw horses on a piece of plywood. So, yeah, not ideal, but I guess I just have to deal with it. What happened here? Sorry about that. Um, as you can see, the tool bed which is this rectangle right here that the vice is mounted on. It's moving very slightly to the left, and as I reverse my direction on the axis, it moves slightly to the right. The reason why this is so slow is because, of course, 
um, the mill prioritizes accuracy over speed. And if you see the same thing will happen for the y-axis, going down and then going up. All right, so there are also two more levers. One is down here, and that locks the y-axis. I can't move the y-axis anymore because of that lever. And let's see if I can remember where it is. Oh, yeah. And then, sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, and then the x-axis over there. And, all right, um, here are the DROs. I will introduce you guys to be a lot more familiarized with this next week. Um, but what I want to do for right now is I'm going to open the chat. Yes, yes, it is very squeaky. I want to um, know if you guys can see this number right here, this uh, like digital watch type screen. Can you see this number right here? Anyone? Any takers? All right. It, it says, right now it says negative 1.612. So hopefully you guys can see it change. It's going closer to zero. That is because I'm taking it closer to the equation. So as you can see, it went from 1.6 to 0 0.5, which like, you know, maybe five or six seconds of turning the x-axis at a moderate pace. So, you know, again, to reiterate, not a very fast tool. But let's say for a challenge with that 0.789 right now, what if I wanted to get it to 0 0.750 exactly, or three quarters of an inch? Oh, I went too far. 0 0.757. 0.752, 0.751. 750, negative three quarters of an inch. That is to the nearest thousandth of an inch. It wasn't very hard to get it to be that accurate. And again, to reiterate, one one thousandth of an inch is a very small increment of measure. It is like, that is minuscule, that is tiny. And we can get that sort of accuracy with the mill super easily, which is awesome. Because a lot of times in robotics, we need that sort of accuracy, and the mill provides that for us. And so I want to, that basically covers what you need to know that I didn't really visualize that well in my presentation so far. So what I want you guys to learn about now is we have this device right here. It uses this handle and you can secure, for example, a pipe in it. Let's loosen that up a little bit. I apologize, but nothing is going to go as smoothly in these presentations because I have one hand holding the phone. And so obviously this device just secures tubing really easily and it sits on the tool bed. So anywhere where you move the tool bed, you'll also move the device and you'll also move the part. And the device is um, very accurate. This is actually called a machinist device. So it's the real deal. And it's connected by this mechanism that um, used in all mills. So the connection between the part and the cutting bit, it's like it's, uh, there's a very low tolerance, it's very accurate. So, yeah. Also, um, actually, and I think that's probably going to be it for the overview right now. Now I'm going to get into the actual instructional process. So, Unfortunately, I will have to close the chat. And what I'm going to do is, I'm actually going to show you guys. It's going to start the lesson now. Or wasn't already started, but you can do it. All right, so, anyways, um, I'm going to do a quick reset of, this, of the mill right now. First off, I'm going to show you guys how to put on an end mill. All right. So 
So if this were an actual lesson, I would start off with the mill being empty, no end mill, just nothing connected to it like this. So how would you put on an end mill? This is basically everyone's first task that they do with a mill. They have to get the end mill and mill down a part and create a nice, cool finish. So how are they going to do that? Well, first off, what you need to know is that each of our end mills, it, it's a specific diameter. And usually we lean toward um, slightly bigger diameters um, of end mill. And so you see this is a, uh, this is slightly bigger than the one that I had previously. So each of these end mills has a chuck that is specific to that size. And so you can see the mechanism here. There are three slots that go all the way, almost all the way down to the base. So these, so each of these three prongs that I've created can bend just a little bit. And when it gets up here, and the mechanism that clamps down, that the mill clamps down onto the end mill chuck, makes it so that the grips the end mill extremely tightly. So first what you do is you get that. You see this transition from um, cold silver metal to um, the brass coated metal. You usually want to put the end mill up until it meets around that transition. So what you do next is, well, you see these prongs, these three prongs right here. At the base, going up here, there's a thick channel. And what that channel does is it locks with, I can just find it real quick. It locks with a, an outcropping on the other side of the mill. So as you can see, I can't spin it around anymore because it's locked in place. But it can still fall up and down due to gravity. So what I'm going to do now is, well, you see that um, I'm not sure how well you can see that, but there are like some threads inside of there, which this bolt locks into. See, it's locked in. So what I do to secure it vertically is I thread the bolt in and I hand tighten it. And then I get these two wrenches. One is a normal twisted wrench one of this other oddly shaped wrench and I tighten it up like so and now there's absolutely no way that this end mill is going to go anywhere and then I put this cover back on because this part is going to start moving when I start the mill and then I'm ready to go as you can see when I start the mill it begins turning which is what we want And that is how you install an end mill. Let me just get the device a little bit closer to me. And so I'm going to show you guys how calipers work. Or sorry, not calipers. I'm going to show you how parallels work. So parallels are tools that we use pretty much exclusively on the mill. These what are what are what parallels are. Do they come in pairs? There's little metal rectangles. There's two of them, and there's two of every sixteenth of an inch in terms of its height. So these are very very tall parallels. These are very short parallels. I'm going to use the shortest parallel for the sake of the example. So what these do is I'm actually going to use my phone and so you can see this part of the device is where the part goes. And like so. And so what this does is let's say that I'm trying to face off the top of the part. There is like barely any room between the start of the device and the top of the part. It's like maybe a sixteenth of an inch. That is not enough. So what we do is we take these parallels and fix them here so that nothing else happens to the device, but all of a sudden, the part itself is elevated by the parallel. And so after you secure, you start to secure the part, 
you can ensure that the vise is still going to stick and clamp onto the part because um, the machine inspect is very accurate, and even if, if you only have a small portion gripping onto the tubing, it'll still hold strong. What these parallels did is, I mean, it's that it's elevated, and now I have all this room to work on the top of the part without having to risk damaging the machinist's pipe, which is awesome. And what I did with the mallet was I made sure that the part was resting on top of the parallel instead of resting in between the uh, cheek of the vice, because otherwise the parallels would have started rattling around and falling out, and we just it's not preferable to them just sticking in. So yeah. All right. And so I want to reiterate that in this case, I was trying to make a, a climbing cut. I would start with the vice closer to me and push the vice away from me, while the mill was cutting with its teeth going towards me, relative from the area in which they're going to be cutting the part. And to create a falling cut, I would start with it back and going towards me. So that is what I'm going to do. I'm going to take out these parallels because I don't need them. But I think I might need to use them for next week. So what you're going to have to do a lot of the time is you're going to be first cutting out a length of tubing on the bandsaw. Let's say that's 4.3 inches and you need to be exactly four inches. So what you're going to do is, first off, you're going to have a rough bandsaw edge as you can see right here. That's bandsaw marks all over it, all over its profile right here. And you need to get rid of it. So you're going to really quickly create a nice smooth profile on the tubing edge. So what I'm doing first is I am lowering the z-axis to the point where the end mill is below the bottom edge of the part. Just as a double check to make sure that I am indeed facing the entire side of this part and not just you know the top half or whatever. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to change my perspective and like crouch down and make sure that when I'm starting to make my cut, uh, so my first cut is going to be forward, of course. So I need to make sure that the mill, the end mill, is going to cut just a little bit off of here. Because if I start off right here, that's going to be a lot to take off at once. And if I start too far away, then it won't take on, then it won't cut anything at all. So I just need to find that balance with a bit of practice you can usually get into um, a rhythm of sorts. And you'll be able to figure out um, how far you need to go past in order to maximize time and also minimize the amount of, um, the amount of noise that the mill makes. Because if there's uh, too much force placed on the end mill, it tends to create chatter, which is just like, um, you know, just the mill could get noisy if uh, you put too much pressure on it, basically. So I'm going to, Turn on the mill, and I'm going to make a final readjustment of the X axis. Then I'm going to start my first climbing cut. And I'm sure a lot of you heard that the mill, when it was cutting through the tubing, was making considerably more noise at the start of the cut than it was at the end of the cut. In fact, the end mill wasn't even touching the part at the end of the cut. That's because um, the bandsaw didn't cut the tubing completely square. It was like off by a little bit. And so that meant that um, I was taking off, you know, noticeable bounce at the start of the cut, but since it was off, you know, just wasn't 
nothing off anything. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to return the piece back just using the y axis. And so what this is going to do is going to create a very shallow falling. A cool thing about that is that it will show exactly where I was able to make the cut and where I still haven't touched it yet. So I'm going to do that really quick. I made the return cut. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make oh, move a little bit to the left so that I have more material to cut through. And then I'm going to repeat this process. That was the second climbing cut. And as you saw, there's a lot of vibration. I had to keep the tools from falling onto the floor. That was just because of this table. It's kind of janky, whatever. And what I'm going to do is what I would do normally is I would check the length of this part each time until I got really close to the final dimension that I wanted. But for the sake of time, I'm going to assume that this was. I got it to uh, the proper length. I'm going to create a falling cut that's going to smooth out the rough climbing cut that I just made. So I'm going to return back to the bike's original um, position. What you'll probably want to do is to just clean the chips off of the part, and also, since um, the end mill isn't very sharp, there's going to be um, some burrs on the edge. For example, I obviously won't feel anything off of this precision machine factory edge, but off of this edge, I can feel a lot of tiny little metal burrs. They're just little outcroppings of metal that I've created from the slightly dull end mill blade. So what I do is I would just take a file and remove all the birds you can see. But other than that, as you can see, this is a pretty solid surface. You can see it's very shiny. And this would be almost completely flat against any other flat surface. As you can see against the flat um, machine device, there's like no wobble in it at all, other than when, of course, I pick it up. So this is awesome. And um, yeah. It's just really satisfying to do. So with that in mind, I want to remind you all, well, not remind you, I need to show you something else. So as I was cutting, I started off here, and then I went through this region, and then I ended up here. So I mean, obviously, right? But 
what I want you to notice is that at the start of the end point, I am cutting through an inch of solid metal for this eight inch span right here. That puts more stress onto the end mill than in this middle region, where I'm only cutting through this portion and this portion, which together adds up to only a quarter inch of metal. So basically, this end mill is cutting through four times the amount of metal than at here and here as compared to here and here, which means that what you want to do is cut through these start and end regions more slowly than through the middle. You might have noticed that I got um, pretty fast in the middle and then slowed down as I reached the end of each cut, which at this point is habitual. And assuming that you guys get ample practice with the mill, it'll be habitual for you too. But when you're just starting out, it's important to keep in mind that um, you need to get slow at the start and the end of each cut when you're doing aluminum tubing, which is almost all that you'll be doing on the mill. All right. Well, that was a pretty long session, actually. It's 4.59 right now. Um, so next week, what I want you all to keep in mind is um, I'll be doing um, the DRO, and I'll also be um, showing you um, other intricacies of the mill. Um, I'll probably be doing some sort of activity with the DRO, as in like actually going through the process of doing the edge finder, finding each coordinate, and you know, filling a hole or something at the very end. So <clears throat> I believe that is it for me. My hour is almost up, and I want to thank you guys very much for joining the meeting. I'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Goodbye.